Welcome, everybody, to the Base Strength Podcast. I am your host, Alex Bromley. I am very fortunate today to have sitting with us world champ uh, in contention, if not having already achieved the title of GOAT, uh, powerlifting phenom John Hack. John, thank you for joining us today. Of course. Thanks for having me. Anytime, man. I'm really eager to uh, get into the mind of a champion. Um, I'll jump right into that because I had a a list of questions from some of my audience, things that they wanted to run by you. And there were a couple of questions that were eager to, to get your take on that title. Uh, You've been a world-class lifter for a couple of years now, but when did your name start popping up regularly in the, in the race for goat? And uh, how have you been, like, how do you perceive yourself in that light? Um, So I'd say like the first, like, kind of really big accolade I got was probably the, the 2k total at 181 and I think that was kind of actually after, after that meet like at the award ceremony I got a shirt that's I, I wore a shirt that said goat on it that was just kind of as a joke but uh that was kind of when I think I first got like into the conversation and then these last couple of years had another few like few uh very successful meet performances and um now it's been i think four years where i've been one of the top lifters and um yeah just uh between that being considered at least like one of the uh the greats of our era and long term i i I still would put ed cohen above me um he had such a dominant run for like 20 years and I'm nowhere near that. So I think, uh, I think like my peak is pretty close to what he's at, but I just need the longevity to really match him. And no matter what, there's, there's going to be people that are going to argue like, Oh, like Ed Cohen's better than me. I'm better than him. So uh, I understand like, I'll never be like an undisputed goat, but um, I definitely honored to be in that conversation. You're getting pretty close, man. I mean, for as long as I've been lifting Cohen's, was it a 903 at 220 was hailed as like one of the most impressive things anybody had ever seen. I mean, you hit a 903, you weighed in at what, 210 at this last meet? Uh, yeah. And then I hit, I hit it at my previous meet. It was at uh, 90 kilos. And you did it conventional and you did it you did it without any supportive gear. And I know it's like kind of apples to oranges, Cause I mean, back then, I mean, raw wasn't really a thing. Everybody had some type of like contraption yeah. they were squeezing into to get a little bit out of it. But the fact that you're so routinely hitting these numbers, you don't do big cuts, right? You, you stay pretty close to like the 198. No, mark. I do pretty decent size cuts. Like I'll cut from like 215, 216 down to 198. I know some middleweight strong, or I know some uh, 90 kilo strongman that cut from like 235. See that like blows my mind. Cause I'm just like, like, I feel like it's one thing to, to cut that and do like a squat bench and deadlift, but like to, to cut like 20, 30 pounds and then go do stones just seems like a bicep tear waiting to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've, I've done a couple big ones. My biggest was 36 pounds. Um, and I mean, from my highest weight to where I weighed in, it was about a day and a half. Um, I, I've never had issues with injuries. I don't know that other people have. If you give yourself enough time, you can kind of rehydrate and get wet again. But I mean, it's not ideal. I mean, if, if for no other reason, the fatigue, like you're 36 hours out from trying to set a world record or something and you're exerting energy, like sweating in a sauna. And there's a point where you're like, why the fuck am I doing this? Like, this is stupid. (laughs) I I had a, I had a beat um, earlier this year, back in February, it was uh, the, the hybrid and, uh, I was, I was trying to make the cut to 198 and I, I got there like 205 and I was, I was sitting in the sauna. I was, it was just me. And like, you've been there where you're in the sauna and you get towards those, like those last like eight pounds or so when it's like, it really starts to get tough and you have to like mentally tell yourself to stay in the sauna. <laughs> um, and it, it was to the point where like I had that, that inner voice being like, get out. And I didn't have the exterior motivation to like stay in. So, and I just texted the the meet director. I'm like, hey, can I just move up to 220? And that was that was technically my first meet at 220 because of that. There you was, go. Was the last like seven or eight pounds really suck in the sauna. 
And it, I always feel like the bar never really moves. Like if I have five pounds to cut, or if I have 30 pounds to cut, it's always the worst cut of my life. Cause I go in expecting it to be easier if it's only a few pounds or I have time to get in gamer mode and really like get aggressive and prepare for it. If it's heavier, cause you're always watching the needle, you know, it's not like this, this like fixed amount of weight that I have to cut that it's, it just gets exponentially worse the deeper you go. Yeah. Uh, one of the coaches I know would like remind his people when they start to get in that mindset, cause he knows like the math of how much water people hold. And he's like, dude, you could cut another 30 if you had to. And people are like, shit, like I'm going to stroke out <laughs> like motor oil right now. Um, yeah, we, uh, we had a lot of success with, um, experimenting with like Amazon gadgets. So we have like a sauna sleeping bag now oh, yeah. with us. Oh, dude, it's great. You lay on the ground and you're just like, you don't have to move. You don't have to hold your weight up. And it just comes off. Yeah. I did one of the, uh, um, the, like, yeah, the sauna, like the at home sauna things where your head's like sticking out. Yeah. Uh, so I did that for one meet and then I, I tried to buy one, but I, I fucked up and I got um, a steam room one and, uh, that, that did not work very well. So, it keeps you wet. Right. So it's like, yeah, you, you like, you get out of it. You're soaked. You're like, Oh man, I lost like, five pounds like i feel like i lost like five pounds that session <laughs> you like find out I'm like oh nope that's all just the condensation from uh -huh. the yeah one of, one of my worst cuts uh i tried to finish with the steam room before i knew better i had a pound to go and i ended up doing like three 10 minute rounds in the steam room and i didn't lose a pound <laughs> one of the most like devastating things i ever did i was like fuck this sport i'm going home um it's 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 definitely a, a different dynamic do you have an opinion on like 24 hour weigh-ins like I know a lot of guys rail against them. They think everything should be day of. Um, um, yeah, I, I like, I mean, I like them because I'm, I'm pretty good at them, but um, I, I get the argument for like, I, I, I kind of wish we could like just keep the rules the same, like no deadlift bar, two hour way ins, just so you can, you can compare like myself to like guys from the eighties and stuff like that. But I don't know, sport evolves, so it does. I want to talk about your last meet. You had a nasty couple of uh, meets over these last two months or so. Uh, and correct me if I have these numbers wrong. Uh, this last one, you had a 2270 total weighing in at 210 with a 766 squat, a fucking 600 pound bench press. And a 903 deadlift. Yeah, it's all right. And that's and that that's that's the best meet you've had to date. Uh, yes, at uh, total poundage wise, I guess like arguably the the one before where I did 2254 or whatever at uh when I cut all the way down to 198 is a uh, like a better pound for pound meet. But yeah, um, I got to talk about like the red lights because I watched a couple of review videos. It was already like just screaming in the back of my head as I was watching this. I was like, what is going on? And then I watched Jamal Browner's video covering, you know, the meat and how his lifts went. Um, you were getting like consistent red lights on squats. It looked like they were three inches below parallel. I, was it the same judge or do you know what was going on with that? It looked like every uh, lift that looked beyond reproach was had an issue. I think I only got red lighted on my first squat. There was like... One judge that was uh that was pretty strict on depth. Um it was, it was Garrett Fear, if like you know him at all. Um, yeah, yeah, it sounds familiar. Yeah. Which um I was fine with. I mean, I, I got it. So I, I think I kind of just like tried to like borderline it on that first one. And then that that kind of like found where my pocket was. And so I just went a little bit deeper on the next two and it ended up being fine. It was funny because uh, I was talking to um jp price the guy who ran the meet and he he was like directly on the side and he's like honestly your your other two look like the form wise look better when you went deeper anyway so i i thought the same thing i thought i thought you looked more decisive um it was just really interesting to see and then given how the sport is with like different federations and there's always some political angle no matter how object or objective or neutral you think somebody is so you can look at like an SPF meet or, you know, the meets like the West side guys would go into 
and you don't know what they're looking for because you'll get squats six inches high, they get passed, and you'll have some that look deeper, they get red lighted. And then you come into a meet like this, obviously it's an entirely different thing with, uh, with sleeves, but, um, it's gotta be frustrating at some point, given the level that you operate at and how many other things you have to fixate on that there's still like that wiggle room for inconsistency. Do you run into problems with that? Does that frustrate you at all? Or do you find that it's not really an issue and you can always kind of pull it out when you need it? Yeah. As long as I'm like healthy it's it hasn't been an issue i had i had some issues with depth like maybe two or three years ago um i think that was kind of coming back from a, like a sprained mcl or i was just wasn't confident in the hole um but now you know, that's not an issue i'm i'm pretty good about being consistent with my depth where probably like 90 percent of the judges will, will white light it so as long as i get like one of the side judges to white light it um, then I at least know where my my strike zone is, and if I need to drop it just another half inch, it's not not a big deal. And you've had some issues with like leg injuries. Yeah, uh, uh, you, you mentioned MCL right there, and I believe you had a quad tear not that long ago. Uh, yeah, so I've been having like issues with basically like on my third squad, just it being heavy that always in the hole I feel like a little bit popping on the outside of my quad and I even had that a little bit in this past meet um but it was pretty pretty minor where it didn't affect me for the rest of the meet but have uh you had difficulty like coming back from those types of injuries when they they put you out at all I mean getting confidence to get that weight on your back and get back in the hole like what is your uh your yeah. rehab protocol look like uh usually it's it's not too bad as long as I have like time to recover um but this past meets were back, back to back it was eight weeks in between so it, it was kind of just frustrating because I, I was hoping like okay maybe like maybe if I can get back to like a a 500 pound squat within like three weeks I'll I'll feel like good but it took about five weeks so then I basically had like three weeks to kind of <laughs> like hit something decent Jeez. training so yeah Basically, I only went over 700 twice in a prep, and it was, it's just, it's nerve wracking when you're basically opening with your, <laughs> your heaviest attempt or heaviest uh, lift. That's bananas, man, to, to go that long without getting under something heavy and then to have such a narrow window to try and, and dial in. Mm -hmm. um, are you ever faced with like the temptation to overreach to try to catch up? Or are you pretty good about? hitting numbers like what does the peak look like going in when you're in that type of scenario with only a few weeks um this one wasn't too too bad because I kind of I kind of went into it with the mentality of like all right I just want to do enough to to win the meet and um, I didn't I didn't care too much for hitting like anything like historic so like right now my big goal is to hit an 800 squat uh 600 bench 900 deadlift at 198 and um, I, I was like, all right, I know like that's, there's no way I'm going to get back up to like an 800 squad. So like, I'm just going to put that off the table. Um, so I'm just going to do what I need to, um, to win the meet. And if I can get a two and a half kilo PR on squat, perfect, which is exactly what happened. But, but I went, to, went into it with like, if I only end up with 750, like I can live with that. That's, um, that's crazy. Um... Your deadlift technique, I mean, all of your techniques stand out because I, I mentioned a little bit earlier, like you have, it's not just that you're really, really strong at a really light weight, like which you are. It's like, I don't think that ratio exists everywhere, anywhere else, but the way that you lift flies in the face of so much of what you see. Cause even with guys who are objectively really goddamn strong, like Jamal Browner, um, these guys that have these huge totals at a relatively light body weight a lot of it comes down to being really advantaged for a particular lift. Um, things where like, you look at that person, you're like, well, that's a deadlifter. You pull conventional, you bench with like a limited arch. I mean, you probably have the most range of motion of anybody that's ever benched 600 pounds. Um, when it comes to your technique, like what kind of led you to your setup was it just very kind of intuitive or do you did you have really a lot of years to kind of tweak and really mess with things to find specifically what worked for you um so i would say this is always kind of like something so weird when like people try and 
like get me to explain my form is that I just kind of went with what felt natural. And like, I guess that was, that was where I started like broadly where I was like, all right, like high bar feels much more natural than low bar. I gave low bar a little bit of a try for a few weeks and I was just like, you know what, this does, just doesn't do it for me. Um, I've like set up for sumo a couple times. I've done like a couple of sumo work, workouts and I was just like, you know what, I, I just physically can't get my hips into a position to um, try this out. And I tried like a wider, wider grip and um, same thing, like a couple of weeks, I, I just kind of felt it, it didn't work for me. So it was kind of finding those, those general lanes I wanted to go in and then just doing, trying out like little small tweaks here and there, like foot placement for bench and stuff like that. And um, yeah, just, just a little tweaks along the way. But well, your deadlift know. is uh, specifically of interest. Uh, I had a few people ask questions about that uh, before this interview. Um, they wanted to know about like the kind of dive bomb approach that you take because it's very interesting because considering how common all the deadlift fuckery is, like it's a meme, right? People twisting yeah. their feet and you know doing the haka or whatever before they deadlift. You walk up, you plant your feet. And you don't even pull tension out of the bar. It looks like, like even people that get straight to the bar usually pump their hips a lot. They're trying to take tension out. There's like this surge of energy. You almost, almost look limp when you get to the bar. I know you're not, I know there's a lot of tension built up there, but your hands go. And once you're, you're down there, it, it's like a forklift. Um, you, you, that's kind of been the way you've pulled from the beginning is just hands on the bar and go. Yeah, for sure. Um, I, I, I used to do like the, the roll, the, the straw man, like roll method. Yeah. For a bit. Um, but yeah, since, uh, I've switched basically to the, I hate when the, people call my deadlift a grip and rip because I don't know, to me, like gripping and ripping is like jerking the bar off the ground. And, uh, like, if you notice with my deadlift, it's very, it comes off the floor, like very flu, uh, fluid, like smooth. And um, I think that's kind of the misconception of the grip and rip. And yeah, I don't know. Just, it's always felt best for me. And if I spend too much time at, down at the bar, I, I just overthink it. It's really easy to do. I get the yips super bad on deadlifting, which you, you think it's such a dumb movement, right? Like you bend over, you pick the bar up off the ground. But the more outs you give yourself to like fuck around with this thing or to like, you know, worry how, like, how are you bracing? What are your lats doing? Am I, you know, grabbing the floor just right with my pinky toe or whatever the last thing you saw on Instagram was, uh, I am really susceptible to that. So it's always kind of fascinating me because some of the best deadlifters I know in person and the ones like you that I've, I've seen from afar to be able to just kind of simplify it into this one really smooth. And you're right. It is very fluid. Like it's like even tension out of the bar and then you just accelerate the whole way up where so many guys that do that will like throw their hands up and then get down and yank to try to get that stretch reflex in. But it almost seems like that's yet another way that you're disadvantaged when you pull that, that you just have all of this horsepower that, that can, that can do that. And it's, it's really fascinating to watch. Yeah. I think that kind of comes from like, like you said, how I got to like where my form is, it was just picking what felt natural. So I'm just doing what my body like naturally wants me to do. So I don't have to think about it as much. Yeah, I think that's a big, uh, important lesson for a lot of people to get into this. I think when people are new, that they, they're quick to try to copy their favorite lifter, and then eventually they'll they'll uh, go towards like the most complex version they they see. You know, it's like the more bells and whistles, that means the more authentic it is, or something. There's a lot of unnecessary complication. No matter what you stick with, like you get good at how you train. So even if it's not you know optimal, whatever that means, like no matter what you do, you're, you're going to grow and adapt around that. And then that's going to be where your, where your pocket is, where you're, you're yeah. the best equipped. Yeah. I do think it is like good for like a, a beginner lifter to kind of like try and emulate a lot of like the, or like at least like watch a lot of like the best deadlifters, best squatters, mm -hmm. lifters, and just kind of like see what things they do. And then you can like try out those things and then just pick from there what you you enjoyed and and then kind of like that like use that to kind of find which path you think you should go on yeah it's a lot of trial and error there's so many different uh 
approaches and builds and, and ways of lifting. You know, but I think people can, uh, can almost feel like they're drowning in it, but yeah, the, the more, uh, experience you get the more opportunities to see what kind of fits um as far as like like you said like emulating the uh, the others out there i've always seen it as like a blessing and a curse that there's like so much information because on the one hand you get like direct access to what the best do which you would think is like really really vitally important stuff but i've experienced this myself like i've gotten absolutely sidelined with like this flood of information i don't know what to do with so uh, it can be tough who would you say were like your biggest influences for like the way you lift and the way you train when you were getting started? Um, so I, I started lifting, I got like a weight set for my 10th birthday. And so I've been kind of lifting since then. I think actually that like is like a big advantage for me is like, cause I basically had like five years of training experience before I was 15 to like kind of figure out what works. Whereas like, so, so like I found out like what works for me at like way before my prime years mm -hmm. and uh, uh but like because of that like a lot of my influence came from like football coaches and stuff like that so it was a lot training more in you know, like an athletic mindset than um purely uh strength-based so like my big influences were um yeah strength and conditioning coaches from football and then on top of that I guess like the people that like really influenced me, I guess I didn't like watch too many like lifters at that time because I mean, there wasn't Instagram or anything like that. Um, but I grew up watching like World's Strongest Man. So like Mario Pujanowski was like a big, big influence for me for um, just like motivating me for how I wanted to lift for strength. I can relate to that. I had a, before the internet and YouTube and whatever, even when like muscle magazines were kind of hard to come by, I used to uh, record on VHS tapes, the world's strongest man. Cause it would, it would air like once a year on ESPN two. And I yeah. make sure to like record it. So I had all like the late nineties, early two thousands. And I would just filter through it over and over. I heard a rumor that you were going to like put your toe in the water with strong man. Do you have any, any plans for that? Um, so I, I got invited, I've done like a few like local meets and then uh, I got invited to official strongman games uh, the last two years. And I really, I was actually planning on going last year, but then I ended up, uh, they overloaded my, my third attempt squad and I got uh, a little bit injured on it. So I just felt like I wouldn't have enough time to like heal from that. And then also, I think it was like an eight week turnaround and then on top of that, there was another meet in January that I wanted to do. Um, that just it, it, it was just too much, yeah. uh, too crowded. So ended up passing out the last year, and then this this year again, like just had two back to back meets and felt super drained after this past one. So um, decided to skip out on it, but. Uh, funny you mentioned it. I am going to train with Martins later today to do some oh, wow. uh, log press because I just enjoy it. All right. Uh, yeah. And then yesterday I was like, for a half second, I was thinking like, huh, maybe I'll ask if I can still hop into OSG. But I was like, nah, I can't, I can't do it. <laughs> I'm going to be there. We'll make a party out of it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I was slated to go last year as well. We had moved across the country. So our house closed escrow on like the day we were supposed to fly out. So we had to pull out of it. But I mean, just as far as a contest goes, it's one of the better ones because I mean, small shows are cool because they're over in a day, right? You get like five events and that's it. You're done. And it's really common now for them to drag these events out for like two, three, four days. But the fact that like, it's not that crowded, they separate everybody. It's only two events a day and it's in Daytona beach. So it's like the location is really cool. If you're going to spend the money and travel, you know, you can go to nationals, which is in like middle of nowhere, fucking Pennsylvania, where it's like, you can go to the beach, right. And, and, and hang out at the hotel. So that's always like our destination at the end of the year. It's a, it's a really cool meet. Um, training with Martins. Have you trained with him before? Uh, a couple of times. Yeah. 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 Uh, what would you say is like the, uh, what gives you the biggest whiplash when like trying to transition to strongman type things? given how you're coming in with this already massive strength base 
Like what, what things do you find are like kind of easy and transfer over pretty well? And like, what's really giving you a hard time? Uh, so like any deadlift movements, but super like, I, I think I've taken first in every like straw man event that I've done like for deadlifting. Um, that's always been my number one thing. Uh, overhead press, I'm, I'm decent at, I'm not, I'm not great. I think that would, that would be something I have to like definitely focus on and like figure out if I really wanted to like commit to straw man. But uh, just a lot of like the balance stuff, like uh, yoke is a tough one for me. It's because like I, I get like very, I, I kind of hit that like oscillation where like it just lose all balance and then I like have to like set the implement down and reset. So, um, but one, one thing I noticed with like one straw man me was just the, <laughs> the like, how much harder each like event was I like I would get done with it I'd just be completely winded and gassed and then they'd be like oh time for like the next one I was just <laughs> like <"Ooh>, seriously <laughs> like let me let me rest for a little bit I had watched I think one of the first ones you did because I had a small gym out in Redlands and one of our guys went to uh, one of the contests at the training hall that Ode Haugen throws oh, yeah. Yeah. and uh, I don't know if that was the first one you did it was a couple of years ago but uh, we watched on the live stream because our guy was in your weight class. We're like, oh, shit, like, let's see how he's going to do. But um, it, it was it was interesting watching because I think it was like a deadlift medley and people were getting like 20 reps on the side handle deadlift. Yep. And it's like, I think you still took it handedly just because it's so light relative to what you're used to, to doing. But that energy system switch is like something else I, I was a little nervous when i saw like how light the weight was <laughs> it, it's worse if it's light yeah so i was like man, if it's like a max out like i'm good like i got mm. this um <laughs> yeah i think i got like 20 something reps or something like that and like i'd never do like uh any like type of frame or like trap bar deadlifts in my last two straw man comps have had that kind of deadlift so it was just uh it was it's totally like different um feel it's, it was like a trap bar deadlift. I think it was like 675 and I almost like lost my balance my first rep because I just wasn't, I, did, I didn't know what it was going to be like. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a different animal and you get more efficient the more you do it because yeah. you know, your timing coordination is better, but it's a, it, again, when you're so strong, it doesn't matter because all the guys are, are working with a lot less hardware than you are, but you always see the really powerful guys at meets like the guys that are going to win the static events. They're always trying to talk the promoters down. They're like, Oh, it's too goddamn late. I don't want to do 25 reps. And that that's part of the sport. No matter what, you're going to end up in those, uh, in those suck fests where you just have to accept, like, I'm going to die a little bit right here, but, yeah. but that's what you have to do. Uh, I have like said for a long time, cause strongman's exploded a bit in the last five to 10 years like all the weight classes that exist, the women's division, those didn't really exist back then. And there's a lot of kind of like blind positivity and strongman. And, and some of it's warranted, like the talent in the weight classes has grown a lot. And it's like really, really impressive. But at the same time, it's not quite like where the open is. Like we know what the best heavyweight strongmen look like. You know, you're not going to really do that much better than a Brian Shaw or a Thor. But I'm always telling the lower weight classes, like just wait one of these guys is going to transition and it's going to stick. And you guys that think like your 800 pound deadlift and 625 squat is like good. Like you're going to see what happens. So I was really eager to see you go into worlds because that's, I think that's like a world of hurt that these guys are not ready for. Yeah. I think if I got like invited to like world's strongest man under 90 or like under 105, I would, I would probably do it. Yeah. Um. That Well, that that's what, that's what OSG is. Oh, is it? They call it officials. I, I know it's confusing. It's the same organization that runs World Strongest Man. So people refer to it as Worlds. And the title is World Strong. They actually have the title. So the title is World Strongest Man under under 90. World I Strongest didn't Man. know that. I thought it was a different event. You thought it was like lower tier, huh? Yeah, um, I thought it was like almost like a, yeah, like a feeder into like. World this Strongest. is they just throw us crumbs. This is the best we have. It's 300 right. people at a warehouse, but, um, but no, it is, it is the most competitive weight class show that exists. Um, the, you can make an argument for a couple different ones, but when I went, it was like guys from Ukraine, guys from Africa, guys from Australia. So people turn out the master's division was all like, it was Adrunas and Terry Holland to Mark Felix. It was all like the big guys out. 
So it's, it's a big show, but at the same time, you're like, it's the same, but you know, we're not on a beach in like the Bahamas, right. Or like in Africa with a waterfall behind us, like world strongest man is we're in a warehouse in Daytona beach, but um, I'm blown away by how much like some of you guys compete, like uh, watching the, like the giants lives guys, man, they're, I feel like they do like a show every other month or something like that. Some of them do. I've heard of guys that they're like, entire training regiment coming up kind of included like weekly contests. Okay. Like that was just like, instead of an event day, it's like, no, I'm doing a contest today. And they would do like 30 contests in a year. There's some guys that are notorious for that. I am a baby. I think I got like a couple small injuries. I'm trying to like keep myself one piece, but I'll compete twice a year. If that, like I need a long run up. I need a lot of months of like lightweight, to, like get my toe in the water and then even then I'm like, oh, I don't know, should I pull out? But yeah, there's some guys that are nasty. Yeah. Like I feel like like Novikov has competed how many times this year? I think he's one of those guys, yeah. I remember back in the day, like Travis Wortmeyer uh, did that. He would compete at any contest that would have him. Um, but he also got riddled with injuries, you know? So, you know, and then you got to figure out how to balance the wear on your body with the uh, the supplement intake and all yeah. the things that make you make I, it up. I need to, I need to come off, man. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to feel healthy for five minutes. I want my pee to not be dark Brown. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, how many times did you compete this year? Um, I get it three meets this year. And once you reach that kind of upper echelon of powerlifting, that's kind of the norm, right? Is, is only a couple big ones. Yeah. Two, three, but there's uh the thing is like in the last like year and a half, there's been a, uh, a big blow up in the number of like money meets, but there, so it kind of spreads everyone out. That, that kind of sucks from my perspective. Like I want to compete in like a couple of meets a year against the very best. And is that people going, those are like different federations or yeah. they, they're just inconveniently lined up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's unfortunate. Um, you see a bit of that in strongman, uh, especially what there used to be just one amateur division in the U S and then now there's like five, there's like U S strongman strongman core. There's this clash series. Now um, there there's non-sanctioned meets to pop up, but yeah, it's very like America's strongest man is this week, I think. And there's a lot of good one Oh fives in it. And a lot of them aren't going to worlds in five or six weeks. So it's like, you see world is this big show. It's, it's one of the biggest ones, but then you see like the smaller national show, it's, it's, it's really weird, but yeah, it's frustrating. I think that's a permanent feature of these type of consumer-based strength sports where you just start to see federations pop up like polyps. Um, I wanted to get to the bottom of some of your training. That's a lot of what I talk about on my channel, uh, programming, how to arrange stressors, how to pivot, um, you know, what each program has in common like that causes them to work in the meaningful, the meaningful ways that they're different. And I'm always fascinated by guys like you because there was such a long journey. And most people, I don't think grasp how much things have to change from when you start to where you start to get competitive and then all the way up to when you're, when you're very elite, how would you say that your training has had to kind of evolve to uh, accommodate as you've gotten more advanced over the years, or has it really changed at all? Do you kind of, have you kind of always done the same thing? Um, so I guess I, I would like describe it as like having like kind of uh, two phases of like my training where like it was beginner where I could get, kind of get away with like five, three, one. I did like cube method for a while. Um, one of those like cookie cutter programs that are just like a very standard powerlifting program that any beginner was going to progress very well on. Um, so that was kind of like the early phases and then once I got to, um, would have been 22, 23. Um, that was when I, the year I went to Worlds is when I started working with uh, Joey, Joey Flex, and um, training with uh, basically up to like the frequency. So before it was kind of like one heavy squat day a week, one heavy deadlift day a week, and uh, one heavy bench and one, like a rep bench day. And that was kind of like my standard training protocol. And now uh, once I started working with like a coach, um, he showed me like upping the 
uh, the frequency really, really benefited me. And then on top of that, just uh, periodization wise, I had to like split on my train from like a off season and a, a peaking block. And since then it's been pretty, pretty much the same. Like I've done, uh, I worked with Joey for uh, like three years, I think. And basically I always did my own off season work, with, um, which was just a, a pretty standard hyperge free, higher volume um, training block. It was like three bench days a week, uh, two squat and one deadlift. And um, kind of my philosophy behind it is I usually go into the, go into a workout with a, a goal weight in mind. And then with like a general like RPE you want to hit and so that's kind of like what's different about like my train versus someone else's is that like usually they'll go in like oh i'm gonna hit like a seven rep at an rp8 whereas i go in i'm like i'm gonna hit like 400 pounds for an rp8 so i'll just rep it until i feel like i get to an rp8 and i just try and up that weight every week but uh yeah so like off season is basically um general volume um not really not really anything. I don't do anything special. And then in season, I just kind of start hitting, I'll hit a weekly single on each lift and try and, uh, I'll do like kind of wave, um, wave periodization with that, like increase it for five weeks, then drop down and increase it for another five weeks. How would you say that you, uh, you split the work in a session between like really specific movements and like variations and like smaller accessory movements? Um, so I do most of my volume and like intensity on, um, the main movements. Like I'm very much, uh, practice how you play kind mm -hmm. of guy. Like I don't, I don't like, uh, too much variation between them. Um, occasionally I'll do like, so like during meat prep, I'll do like my main heavy, heavy single on like squat bench deadlift. And then if I have like a secondary day, sometimes I'll do it as like straight bench or like I'll switch it out for like Larson press and just try and like increase that each week. Um, but it's always going to be a main, main variation. And then like accessories from that is just kind of go by feel. Like if I feel like I have a little bit more energy and like, if like my triceps feel like they're not uh, like firing as well, I might hit a little bit more tricep work that week, but it's, um, I would say like most of my like actual programming is based on the main movements and then just say the accessories by feel. I think got to believe that that's pretty standard amongst like, you know, the top 1%, the guys chasing the records. It's like the more developed you get towards a specific goal, the more specialized you have to be to keep chipping that away uh, more and more. I'm always blown away by high frequency type approaches especially as popular as it is, because it seems, it seems like, I don't know if there's a resurgence of that, or if I can just see it more because of social media, but guys that are benching three days a week or more, you know, squatting three days a week, deadlifting twice a week. I know myself, I'm made out of like peanut brittle. <laughs> so I'm constantly trying to like baby inflammation and it's like, okay, well, if I don't deadlift 10 days apart, I'm going to be useless. Or if I squat more than once a week, my knees are going to kill me. Have you had any real trouble with that? Um, so actually like what's kind of funny was I was having a lot of uh patellar tendonitis in my knees from squatting and then what actually helped a lot was increasing the frequency interesting because uh basically I would like I would go into it needs to be really achy but because I, I had the mindset like oh I'm only hitting like one squat day a week like I need to go heavy this squat session and then so like it would maybe be like an RP nine or 10 workout on squats. And then once I switched it up and went to like two or three days, I think I started actually like three days. I remember like my coach like sent me three days a week and I was kind of like, I don't know, man, like, <laughs> <laughs> okay, like easy. Uh, those became like RP like six or seven workouts total. And um, it just helped a lot for, building up like the tendon health and then um, I didn't have to push quite as hard on each like individual lift. And once, once I built up that strength of the tendons, I was able to kind of 
up the intensity in like one or two of those workouts. Um, listening to you talk about like the RPE stuff, um, the, like how you pick a weight and then you just take the reps to wherever you feel like it's uh, appropriate. Yeah. It sounds like you tend to err on the side of staying a bit lighter. So are you not one of these like kind of top set every workout guys? Like you start off pretty light and tend to give yourself a runway. Um, yeah, but I also kind of know like how my body's going to adapt. Like if I do like a five week, um, five week block, I kind of know, like, let's say my goal is going to be like seven reps on, um, each lift. I know what, like my, my best seven rep is. So I kind of try and like set it up to where on like that fifth week, I'll hit like a, a PR on that seven reps. And, but like, if it's not there, then I'll only do like six reps or something like that at that weight. Gotcha. Now there's a lot of talk about every time somebody like comes out and does something really impressive. There's always this talk about like, well, what could they do if I see a lot of people talking about your potential and some like hypothetical scenario, you know, like low bar. <laughs> exactly. Like, like what, uh, what if you gained 50 pounds, whatever I heard your, um, thinking of moving up to the two twenties, like, um, yeah. So this past meeting I did, that's like a, a 220 lifter. Um, I'll still probably, I, I still want to hit, uh, 2300 at 198. It's kind of my last goal at 198. And then once I hit that, then I'll basically commit to moving up fully. Um, but even then I don't think I want to be like, it's like right now I cut about 18 pounds. Like I, I don't want to get up to 238. Yeah. Just, uh, it, a, it wouldn't happen overnight, and the I start to feel like uncomfortable about 220. I can uh, definitely relate to that from the strongman side of things. Even in the weight classes, it's like ingrained into the culture. Like, if you want to hit a 20 pound deadlift PR, you have to go eat a bunch of sodium and carbs and blow it up like Kiriako style. Um, I, I started competing, I think I was like 190 or 200. And I just remember every benchmark, there's like three months where I feel like shit. And then I kind of get used to it. You know, I was 230, then I was 250. I was at like 280 temporarily. And that's probably the worst month of my life. It's, you can't bend over entire shoes. Like the blood pressure is crazy. Yeah. Takes I, a, so, takes yeah like, uh, I definitely, uh, I'll take it like slowly once I commit to like 220. I'll just kind of eat as my body naturally wants me to. And do you have some goals at 220 you think are realistic uh, above that 2300 total? Um, I'd definitely like to at least match like Ed Cohen's um, 220 numbers. I think he hit like 2405 or something like that was his best 220 meet. So, wow. uh, yeah, that was, I guess, somewhat equipped. I don't know if you can call it really equipped because their, their equipment back then was, wasn't the best. But, um, yeah, that, that would be like my main Thing I want to want to cross off the list. You want to stamp that that goat title in the cement. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Um, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, really quick before we sign off, is there uh, anywhere that people can find you? Uh, any projects you want to talk about? Oh, you were talking about the uh, the Evolve AI. Why don't you tell people about the uh, project you're working on? Yep. So uh, we're uh, launching. We don't have a set date yet, but we're looking at like mid October um, to launch. It's called Evolve AI. It's a artificial intelligence programming app that uh, you can download. Looking at about fourteen ninety nine a month is the price, and it's um, basically a conglomerate with uh, like myself, uh, Andy, Andy Wong, um, Mike Desheer is the main main coach involved with it, and then we also have a few PhDs to uh, continue research and the biggest thing is we um it's gonna be an app help a lot all your training you program or you put in like meet date um and then you can kind of tell it like which kind of training has worked best for you in the past and it'll write up your whole program for you to follow um changes week to week you do like daily check-ins on like how you're feeling on that day and it'll just the, the training for that day based on like how your your sleep hydration, 
all that's um, all those factors. And um, yeah, really excited about it. Should be should be launching soon. Well, that's fantastic. We'll keep an eye out for that. Uh, John Hack, thank you so much for stopping by. Everybody, go ahead and check John out on his YouTube, on his Instagram. Until next time, this is Bromley. I'll see you.